Uh, I'm not a public speaker, I'm a greyhound trainer, or I try to be. Uh, but uh, in saying that, probably for 10 to 15 years I've been um, banging on doors in a GRV and anyone that wants to listen about the need for change, and this is way before live baiting. And uh, my belief that we've got a situation where uh, a puppy's born, uh, only a small percentage make the track, and when they get to the track, they only have uh, a limited race career. And this is compared to world's best practices. So I've been banging on doors for years, and I've been going overseas for the last 15 years, sometimes three or four times a year, because I've got a great friendship for a lot of greyhound people overseas. See so a lot of things we wouldn't do over there. There's a lot of things that we do way, way better than them, but it doesn't matter where you go, you see things, you say, what a great idea that is. The one thing they do have overseas that, um, and I'm talking about America now, that we don't have is clean racing. I think our tracks were built by bookmakers. And, <laughs> and, and it goes right through to the confidence of the dog where after a few starts they start to think, well, is this really worth it? Now if that dog has a clean racing through its career, it builds confidence and it, as I said, it, it builds on itself. A um, perfect example I can give of that, over the last 10 years I've brought out about 20 dogs from America and I've had at least two of them didn't get to the track in pre-training or pre, they broke hocks or did something went wrong along the way. I had a couple had 10 and 12 starts. I've had one had 30 odd starts. And I go back and have a look at the litters they came from that raced overseas. And without a word of a lie, the majority of them had over 100 starts. And a lot of them had 180 starts out of that same litter. Now that either says I'm a bad trainer or we're doing something different than they do overseas. And this is what I've been banging on doors about for the last uh, few years. But until live baiting, no one wants to really listen. And I do think now we have got an opportunity that we can get real change because the wastage, and I'm not talking about wastage as far as when they finish racing, the wastage along the way is totally unacceptable. Now, some of the things I've just mentioned, I'll bring up again as I go through my, my thing here. But what I wanted to just show first um, when I saw Paul's presentation at Maitland, and we saw the hamsters and his talk about the uh, uh, positive reinforcement. Uh, I spoke to a lady in Seattle that's an adoption lady that does agility testing uh, during the week. And she uses greyhounds. Not many people do. They use all sorts of dogs. But she uses greyhounds because she's a greyhound adoption person. And uh, so I chased around trying to find a video of of greyhounds doing agility, and this is exactly what Paul was talking about. So if you want to think outside the square as you're watching this, put it on if you like, Cecilia. If you want to think, what could we possibly do to make dogs better box dogs, <coughs> get down in the boxes, do things that at the moment we virtually throw them in and hope they come out the other end. And I know there's people, good people that do things differently, but in general, we, they're either, we either say they're born a, they're born a box dog, or, or they, they're no good. Now, honestly, when you see what Paul did with his dogs with, with positive reinforcement, who's to say we couldn't get a dog down sitting perfectly in a box? And that's just one example of the things that we've missed along the way. But this, again, as a greyhound, through positive reinforcement, you notice you'll be giving it a, a piece of kibble all the way around. It's getting it doing things. How the hell would we get a greyhound doing this? We can't even get them go around a track. <laughs> There's another uh, side to this, which I'll bring on later too, is the fact that it's another avenue for our dogs that were not wanted. And it's not just agility, there's massive sport overseas, and there's a little bit of it in Australia, called lure coursing. And it's not the normal lure coursing that we do, it's, uh, it's around a, a course. And it's very, very popular, especially amongst families and young families. And again, it's just something we can look at as, along as we go to say that, hey, this dog's not gonna make it, but boy, you'd make a great dog in agility or a great dog in... So again, it's just little areas we haven't looked at as we go along. 
Okay, the, the need for change. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, keep breeding and uh, rearing in the same thing here where I've got them separately on the board. Uh, less than 60% of the dogs here are named that, that are born. When I mentioned this overseas and they, to the, the big breeders where we sit around and have a barbecue, they were genuinely shocked. They don't believe it because 95% of their dogs make the track. And then you've got to say, well, um, what, what are the differences? What are the reasons? And uh, just one little example I'll give is you go to uh, Vince Berlin's place where he's got 800 dogs on the property and I heard someone say, how can someone do it with 10 dogs? He's got 800 dogs on the property and you go into the whelping sheds and you might have 15 or 16 whelping sheds along there and there's a woman sitting in there and she goes from one whelping shed to the other when they're about six to eight weeks old. She just sits with them and pats them. We wouldn't... Well, some people might think of doing that, but it's something we don't generally do. And I asked the question, why would they do that? And they said that they believe between six and eight weeks, that is when they, they, they form where they bond with humans. So it's another thing where you see dogs that are a bit scatty, a little bit uh, timid, and the rest of it is something that it might be just one little thing that helps along the way. But again, there's not much we can... We can learn from the training overseas. As I said, not everything's great, but their rearing and breeding is head and shoulders above us. And that doesn't mean everyone does it, because as I said, there's some fantastic rearers and breeders in Australia. But when there's 300 litters that don't make the track, it tells you some people are doing a pretty average job as well. And that's, I think, where our, instead of probably bringing in pink cards and the rest of it, I think that's where our authorities should be looking at, the people that don't get results and we either get rid of them or we bring them up to the mark. Now, uh, could you just go back one again, Cecilia? Just on the, on the breeding, and I'm not, I, I don't profess to be a great breeder, but one thing I have noticed overseas is that they'll look further than, uh, than the last stud dog that retires. In other words, we look at a dog, he's, he's run, at, the, at this, this few weeks it'll be Fernando Bale. He's the quickest dog. He's about to retire, so everyone wants to go to him. Does anyone look to what his temperament's like? What his confirmation's like? Um, how many starts he's had? And he's had, but I'm, I'll go off Fernando Bale, but other dogs that only have three and four and ten starts, do we say, well, why was it? Was it because the, the stud master's a bit concerned that once he reaches top grade, he mightn't be able to handle the pressure? And there's all things that they factors that we, that we don't look at that they look at overseas. And I think Paul said it before when he, he said how they've improved their breeding to, because they've bred a dedicated jo dog. Well, this basically all they're doing is they're weeding out the, or eliminating the problems along the way. And I, honestly, I'd stud dogs in the 80s and 90s. And I can't remember anyone ringing me up and wanting to come and see that stud dog and have a look at him and see what his temperament, temperament. But all they're worried about is their last start. Another example of it, the fact it's a, a fashion industry, is uh, last few years I've had a couple of dogs racing. One was Symmetry and the other one was Above All. And while they were racing and they were in, winning group races, the phone was ringing off the hook, people wanting to use them. And at the time, I said, no, they won't be used until they retire. So along the way, a couple of injuries later, and the dog has eight and 10 months off, and then phone stop ringing. No one's interested. There's another dog on them. So it is a fashion industry in Australia. And unfortunately, um, th that doesn't mean you're not gonna get a, a great pup out of that latest dog, but it tells you that the mentality is that they're not looking at the whole picture. Rearing again, as I said before, I'll throw it in with, uh, uh, with breeding as well. Again, a lot of our dogs are reared on factory farms and again, I'll say that again, not everyone does a bad job on a factory farm, some do a real good job. But the fact there's 300 litters every year that don't get named, total litters, says that we've got to lift our game in that area and I, I'm not a great believer in regulation because I think, but I do think if they're going to bring in regulation, that's where they've got to look at it. You've got to look at the people who are not doing the job. Now, what I wanted to show you here was 
what would be wrong with clubs providing this sort of service in the middle of their grounds for people to come along with their five and six months old litters in this day and age where we've got to change and we've got to look for other things. And I honestly think even those people with the 300 litters that don't make the track, maybe they should be actually forced to come along. And at four to six to eight months, they must be proved that they're, they're doing work with those pups along the way. Now, all this is is a, a Woolies shopping bar bag. And it, it, you'll see, look, there's, hunt, there's 200 videos of this on the YouTube, and all they do is go around like a, a small footy ground. Um, all sorts of dogs, uh, not all, a lot of whippets, but a lot of all sorts of uh, bassets, everything go around. And I'm certain there'd be a lot of breakers that would, uh, would be very pleased if people were doing this with their pups at five and six months of age. Yeah, when you watch this, you'll see some of the dogs, they've, they've worked this course out, they take shortcuts the whole way. <laughs> Again, as I said, uh, there is a, an element in this that um, makes our percentage that make the track so poor that really what they do, as owners, they'll put the dog out onto a farm. Uh, basically, that dog gets fed and at 14 months, they take it and they can't even put it on a lead and they take it to the breaker and the poor old breakers expect to work miracles. And that's been the, that's been the uh, uh, something that was happened over the years. And I tend to think it's played on itself. Because that happens, we tend to breed more. And then we breed more, simply because we have to, to replace those bad dogs. Again, along the, uh, I've probably spoken about all this anyway, but the socialisation and the handling, just go back one again so I knew where I was. <laughs> the handling along that way is so important. Uh, lead training, walking with a companion animal, all these little things and as people say, hell, if you've got 50 dogs, how do you do it? Well, maybe it's better to have less dogs and, and get them all to the track. But as I said, we, as kids growing up with dad, we never knew what it was like not to have a dog make the track. They weren't all quick, but they all made the track. And what we would do, we'd go out with a companion animal, we'd have eight dogs on leads, and we'd walk, and they'd only be seven or eight months age, and the companion animal, whether it was an Alsatian or Labrador or whatever, they'd be chasing rabbits and that through the bush. These dogs would just focus on them like you wouldn't believe. They broke themselves in those dogs simply by the excitement and the thrill of just watching that didn't have to do anything, those dogs chased. And as I said, there's nothing wrong with still doing that. I don't think they've, they've outlawed that yet. So, um, um, The sights and noises that they'll see at break-in and pre-training, and what I'm saying is what should you have in your uh, training age that you, right from uh, the whelping box through to, to uh, the, the rearing yards, well, I honestly believe that it's very important. Do you want to go on to the next one, thanks? It's very important that they, the industry um, standard on, standardise on a squawker, a, a car alarm, whatever it may be, that they standardise on it so that you know as a rearer and a, and, a, and a breeder, and you know that when you come to trial at Richmond, and then you know when you go to race at Wentworth Park, that the same thing's going to be there. So that you start right from the whelping box to teach that dog that that's the excitement machine. That's what's going to get you going. That's what's going to make you chase. Um, and for example, everyone's got these now. I sort of brought them into Australia about 15 years ago. Now, even when I said before about walking the dogs with a companion animal in group, there's nothing wrong with having one in the pocket. Every time they, they ears go, so you're all the time teaching that dog that that's the stimulus. And then, and it, look, as I said before, I beat my head on against a brick wall about getting these onto the lures in Victoria. And I don't know how many times reluctantly they do it, and then three weeks later they're not working. And you go into the steward's room, you say, listen, that uh, squawk is not working tonight. And they look at you and say, well, you know, so? 
so in other words, they don't really understand that what you're trying to do is make that dog associate all the way through. And I think that that's where you know, we've, got to, we've got to start to make sure that even before the meeting, the stewards walk around, they test these things. They make sure they work. And then, same thing, we start getting the, the breakers to start using the same thing. But they've, again, they've got to come back and, and standardise on something first. I wouldn't care if there's three different things on there, as long as it's always the same. Uh, would you like to show that whippet? Again, just back, we're still on the puppies at the moment. And again, the same squawker noise can be in a sock, can be in a something, but just to flick it around with your puppies and things like that all the way through. Uh, this is just something I found on YouTube, but, and that's not a squawker, but it's just something I found. But if you've got a, five or six of those puppies going around like that, it's just again, it's, it's, it's what Paul Wheeler said once, that someone asked him, when does he start training his dogs? And he said, they start at birth. And I think that this is where we've probably missed the boat a bit over the years, or a lot of us have. Uh, racing stage, uh, again, this is something that's pretty shameful, really. The fact that we achieve in Australia, or we, I know it's Victoria, I don't know about anywhere else, 11 starts per year per greyhound. World's best practice is 39. Um, we emailed Gary Gusciani, and um, he's the secretary in America, and he had those figures, and he said they do 39. It sort of says to me that, well, uh, there's got to be reasons for it. Now, I'll go through all the reasons, I think. But again, forgetting about the wastage as far as at the other end, what about the wastage for that owner that's paid his money for his pup, he's got it reared all the way through. The wastage for the trainer has got to get another one to replace it and it's had an average of 11 starts. The value's not there. Why would you want to risk going paying money when world's best practice, we're so far behind it, it's not funny. And I, I, I honestly think there's so many simple things that we can do to increase that within a week without even looking at changing tracks or anything like that. So, as I say, um, yeah, next one. Uh, first of all, just some of the little problems we have is here we mark a dog by what time it can run. We all talk about it, the dog runs quick. When you're overseas in America, they don't never talk about it. Times are nothing, it's wins. It's all about wins. The tracks are slowed way down. In between each race, you'll see them go, go round with teeth about a uh, half inch long, will just furrow the top of the track after every race and then flatten it out. So it, I would say it's conservatively 12 lengths slower than our tracks, over 500 metres. And the first thing Australian people are going to say when you do that is, hang on, my dog can't run it out anymore. He said, so the track's soft, the track's off. And again, I think that's just something we've got to suck it in and say that maybe we've got to start looking at our breeding. And it's a whole, it's, it's something where if we want to have 39 starts as average, we've got to start to seriously think, slow down these tracks and look at our breeding so they can run 500 metres. And it's, that's a long term thing, but the tracks themselves can be slowed down in a week. Just a quick story, in Wheeling in West Virginia, David Peck's the secretary over there and he came out and stayed with Graham Bate for a few weeks and he went to all our tracks and he went back raving. He said, these tracks are magnificent. And they look so good, they're flat and hard. Well, he got the groundsmen to prepare the tracks exactly the same as they would be prepared in Australia. They did 37 hocks in the first month. He nearly got lynched, I can tell you. But they're now back to where they were and exactly the same at Derby Lane. Now they, they went and tried the Australian experiment. The trainers nearly lynched him and, he's, and they're back to where they were. So we have never seen tracks like that, so we just expect that this is what we want and this is what we should have. And as I say, initially you're going to have your, your people say, no good because my dog can't run it out anymore. Well, I'd rather have a dog and I'd rather have him have, you know, uh, 39 starts rather than 11. Um, 
sorry, sorry there. The lure position. The lure position, have a look at that on the first turn. Now, our lure position is such that every dog wants lane one. And you see it time and time again from if you stand behind the boxes where they all want to be in the same lane. Now, then you get a dog that after a while he gets a couple of whacks, so he wants to get off. So then all of a sudden the racing's rougher again. And this all comes back to confidence as to why a dog only has a few starts, because he starts off, he thinks this is great. He gets a few whacks, he starts to think, well, maybe it's not that great. But again, uh, I was at uh, Woodlands in Kansas watching the races one night. This is when I first went over there. We watched 14 races and I said to David Burnett, who was with me, I said, David, have you seen a dog get hit yet? It, hasn't, it looked like in, just running in lanes. And we went back to our hotel and we watched all the replays. We saw one dog hit another dog for the night out of 14 races. And what it is, there's a few tricks to it why it happens. One is the lure is another three feet out. So it runs around, it's not the middle, but it's pretty close to the middle. The other thing is, and this is the big trick it could be trained, changed in a week, is where the boxes, where the lure's positioned when the box is open. Now, in America, the, the lure would be 40 metres down the track when the box is open. And what actually happens is the focus of that greyhound is down the track and they do run in lanes. Whereas here, they all want to get to the fence because that's what they're chasing. And I, I can prove that because I've had dogs race in America and then come and race in Australia. And it's just so amazing. It's, you can see it on video where the same dog in America comes out of box five and runs in box five, runs that line. Comes to Australia and knocks half the field down. It's trying to get to the lure. Yes. I just wonder, could we still do it around a corner or would they lose sight of it? Uh, all, the, all the 500 metres are on straights, mm -hmm. but some of the 600s are on bends. Okay. So uh, another little hint to that was, I mentioned this at Maitland, Ronnie Stevens, who was the lure driver at Geelong for many, many years, he said to me, and this is why it was 20 years ago I thought about this, he said, every time I drive the lure past way too quick, they all run straight because the, by the time the, the lids are, they get going, they're all looking up the track. He said, every time I run it past when, the way I should do it, they go left. So there's, there's lots of hints here to say that we could clean racing up very, very quickly, but there's one problem here and it's the word called uniformity. And every time we've knocked on doors and gone to authorities and said, listen, we know how to make this racing cleaner. Uh, you can't do that because they don't do it in New South. Or they don't know what happens if their dog comes down here, he's going to hit his head as soon as the lure's there. But again, you've got to start from somewhere. And, and okay, maybe the current generation of dog, make, there'll be a few of them do come forward and hit their head, but the next generation won't and they might have 39 starts. There was another little interesting thing called a safety lure. Again, I'm just trying to pick off little things that make a different, that make a difference to losing a dog or not losing a dog. I had a dog uh, last Friday at, uh, at Geelong, uh, last Tuesday at Geelong. It fell not far after the start in the, three, the 390 metres. It ran back the other way, lure came around and cleaned it up. Now that dog, it may race again, it may not. It's, it's a, it's a mess. Now, in America they have a safety lure. Cecilia, I don't know whether we've got that. There was a couple of, I may have a, a sample of this, um, where if any accidents, they can see an accident about to happen, they've got the ability, the lure driver's got the ability to fold the arm back in against the, against the uh, uh, rail. Now. Now, there's four spots around the track, you can hit a button and it just, it, it just automatically happens. No, that's not it. Uh, so, so. Was it a YouTube video? No, don't worry about it, it's okay. But look, they're, they're, if you want to look it up, Red, Red Hound Safety Lures, and they're at every track now in America. And they very rarely has to, have to use them, but it's the same old story. What happens the day that a kid runs out in the track or something like that? Well, you've got the opportunity, or a drunk like they do in the Bucks Nights. 
you got the opportunity to abort the race by that lure disappearing. Um, now, the next one is a controversial issue because the run on lure uh, polarises people. Some people love it, some people hate it. And there's a few in the middle that wouldn't care. But in general, I'd like to produce evidence to basically say we need it. If we need change, um, until someone can come up with um, something that makes a dog chase and is better, I think this is a no-brainer. We have to go with it. I'm not saying that we need it at every meeting. Not, I believe we should have choice. So the people that are completely against it or believe they've got that dog that is so crazy that, that it's going to be adverse to their dog, that he can avoid it. But the people who think they need it or the majority of people who just, just will use it anyway can follow it. So I, I'd be advocating they use it at least once or twice at each track per, per month. Now, I think the figures down the bottom there tell us everything. In, that's in Queensland when they had their finish on lure. Without the finish on lure, the rate of suspensions was one in 15 races. 2009, when it first started, went to 136. 2010, with it, it went to one in 69 races. There was a suspension. When it went back without it, one in 23. The next year, when they had the hoop arm, the next the hoop arm that they're trying to bring, one in 12.5 races. There's a suspension. That doesn't tell us about all the other dogs that are back in the field are only going around in memory and not really chasing. Now, all it tells you is the ones that got conviction. So for an integrity issue in our sport as well, as far as, and to make your dogs chase, integrity for the punter, I think the finish on lure is a no brainer. Now they've had it for 40 years in New Zealand and they wouldn't have it any other way. So we don't need to do trials. We, they've been trialling it for 40 years over there. And I honestly think that um, for those people who object to it, don't go to it. And there's, there'd be, there'd be uh, certain circumstances I'd agree they shouldn't have it and would be, say, a 35 degree day. Uh, 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 feature race heats and finals. So, that, so that, that person that completely objects to it that has that real good dog, doesn't have to. But again, choice, that's what we need. We need choice to be able to go to these things. If we believe our dog is only 80% chasing and 90% chasing, we've got the opportunity to do it. Now this all comes down to wastage again, and there's no doubt it makes dogs chase better. You only have to look at the dogs that have gone to New Zealand. Dogs have had convictions here that have had 60, 70, 80 starts over there and never look like doing anything wrong. And, and there's a there's another very, very valid point to this, is that while everyone knows that live, live baiting shouldn't occur and it, and it can't occur in the future, the industry needs to provide things like finish on lures so that there is no need to use them. There's got to be seen that if you think you've got a dog that's only half pie chasing or going around in memory, you can actually follow this for a while. With the trials at Geelong and Shepherd and have had over the last eight weeks I suppose. I've been using it a lot, my brother's been using it a lot and we really think there's been two or three dogs you can markedly see have improved simply because they, and as I said, go back to what I said before, I don't think you need it every week. And this, you'll get an argument with this too, Paul Willis says you need it every week. I said, I said I disagree because when a dog in his natural environment's chasing a rabbit, he doesn't chase catch that rabbit. The rabbit goes down a burrow one week, it goes into a bush the next time, but he might get it once every three months, but boy, he's chased it next time, and that's what happens. Okay, uh, just on the finish on lure and, and how we actually use it in training, and you guys probably see the same here every week, but I just want to show a couple of trials that I do. I pair off all my dogs, and all these dogs are pre-trainers, most of them are just off break-in. Um, and I've just done this with, uh, my son's done it with his phone, but um, I've got a lure that has got a heap of bounce in it. It's, it's actually bamboo with a rubber thing over the top. You'll see it as it comes around the second time a lot better. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter that. But, oh, you can have the, no the squeaker noise if you like. And what I've done here 
as it's going around the trial, I've got another dog that I'm a bit, I won't go in on it properly. And as the lure comes back to, to walking pace, I slip him in with it. Always have a muzzle on the dogs for the finish on lure. And if you can see the bounce in this lure, and I think that bounce and the squawk all happening at the same time, it gets a hell of a lot of pre-trainers going. And the fact, and I'm a great believer that Greyhound's a pack animal. And I do think that, I don't believe in trying this uh, soloing, uh, solo with the pups, uh, twos and threes. And I think one teaches the other. You see a lot of experienced breakers and that they've always got a, an old brood bitch or something they use to help the other dogs get going. And I think this is the same. Whereas, uh, whereas you've got, you try to pair one off, you know it's going to go in on it against one that's not going to go in on it. I like a fair bit of flap in it, but I do like, as, as for these puppies, what I'm talking about, I like the spring in the arm. Whereas I've got muzzles on them, and what actually happens is quite often they'll go up, grab it with their feet, and, it, and it'll just shoot back up, and it's, it stirs them up. So, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get these dogs to really enjoy this. I don't know whether I've jumped anything on the racing phase. I probably have because I tend to jump all over the place. But uh, one of the other things that I've noticed in America is that the, the retirement adoption system just beats ours hands down. There's no such thing. You never, ever hear anyone saying they're going to put a dog down. They all say the same thing. They say, we're going to pet it out. And they all get petted out, every dog that doesn't go back for breeding or, or is not kept for whatever other reason. Now, they've got something like 300 voluntary adoption agencies. They're all small, but they're all around the country. My son spent uh, three or four months there, just he's only been home a month, uh, working for an adoption hauler. He's took, taken dogs to Seattle and other places. And it's like a, uh, he said coming into the, where they stop, like a Richmond track here, he said all the people are cheering, they get their dogs coming. He said they're like heroes. And it tells me that we've got a situation in Australia where we ring up to get our dog in the adoption program and they say, look, um, keep the dog for another six or eight weeks and we might have a spot in February. Well, that's just not good enough. It just doesn't work. We're trying to run a business and it's not our responsibility as trainers, it might be the owners, but we end up having to cop it in the neck to keep that dog or tell the owner to take it back. And that's one of the very big reasons why dogs get put down. It's because the system fails, as it stops. Now, that doesn't say America's got 300 million people and everyone says, well, that's why they can do it. But on the last research I did, there's 600 adoption groups in, in Australia. We don't use any of them. We basically use our own GAP programs, which are really have been Mickey Mouse up until the last few months. And, and there's a couple of others that do help out, but the side benefit of these adoption people, most of them in America were completely anti-racing, hated racing people. But what's happened along the way, because say for example, the ones down at, in Florida near Derby Lane track, they get to know the trainers by phone calls, look, I've got another dog for you and they take it out. And half of them now are in racing. And one of them in particular, she's on the NGA. In other words, it's completely, they've seen, not only is it good for the dogs, but the adoption or anti-greyhound people have seen another side to greyhound people that were not all monsters and we do care for our dogs. And it's really changed it around. So what I'm getting at is our model needs to look at their model very, very quickly. Just another side thing on that adoption too. There's a program that started in America <laughs> where, I'm well, not so certain how big it is, but some of the adop adopters in Wisconsin actually pay the owners up to a thousand bucks to be able to name that dog at 12 months follow it through its career and then get it at the end. So they've got this joy of watching this dog. It's a, it's a, it's a proud mum's type thing, I think, where they watch their dog and they say, we're getting this dog at the end of its career. So there's little programs that could be started up. As I said before, I think the future, we need to create benchmarks, whereas we've let things 
go from one thing to another to create, which is created wastage. And as I said, if we started creating benchmarks in the rearing process, for example, when the rear, when the ear brander goes out there, what would be wrong to say, listen, I want to see those dogs chasing that thing behind a piece of string. He'll have one in his pocket. Now, what it'll do, it, it'll make that person that's got that dog say, gee, the ear brander's coming here next week, I better get these dogs out and do something. And that's where I think we, if we create benchmarks along the way, that just maybe that the, and, and going to the next one where I said that lure coursing, provide it, provide that lure coursing so that the, so that the opportunity is there for the person with the litter says, let's go down on a Sunday and see if these dogs will chase that thing. And you send them around in a pack. Now, I'm not saying that should be regulated, but the, the opportunity there should be there to be able to do it. Yep. Now, I just want to show another lure coursing one this is uh, in Queensland, and it's not greyhounds, it's bassets and a bit of everything else, but very interesting that this is how it started in America, and a few greyhound people started to go along with their retired dogs and doing it, and all of a sudden it's created a tremendous promotion for greyhounds. What I was getting at is these, these associations already exist in Australia, and I do believe that the greyhound industry should really look hard at them to be able to co-join them, to be able to have dogs that are ready to retire, that can go in and do this type of thing. People with puppies can go along and put their pup around a course. And then not only that, the side benefit of that, of the greyhound industry, start so, so showing us a bit of a social side as well. You look at this, have a look at how many young people are there. And there's something, we look around this room, there's not too many of us. <laughs> 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 now if you can't, I'll just finish off anyway, if you can't get your dog to chase and you, and you think you're at a wit's end, this is the, what you should try next. Now you go and get it off him. <laughs> <laughs>